uh, this particular story involves two people who were in a car, um, a, a man and a woman in a car, uh, parked on what, what back then was just a picnic area uh, in the middle of the night. Something large, hairy, and two-legged picked up the rear end of their car and held it. You know, they were they were gunning gunning the gas and uh, couldn't go anywhere. And finally, it dropped it, and they took off. And they uh, they told a, they allegedly had told a park ranger about it. There's this whole other portion that's kind of this conspiratorial cover up uh, that also probably never happened. Uh, I've been told by so many people that oh yeah, after that happened, uh, we tried to go out there to see you know where it happened at, and there were two armed rangers you know blocking off the road and telling turning people away. This episode of Bigfoot Society contains a chat with John Hickenbottom, naturalist from Salt Fork State Park in Ohio. John is a known and vetted individual within the Bigfoot community and is very respected within the Ohio DNR. Enjoy this conversation. All right, Bigfoot Society, thanks for coming back to another episode. We have the privilege of talking again to an old friend, Mr. John Hickenbottom. How's it going, John? Good. How about yourself? Oh, I, I'm doing great. I, it feels like I just got to see you out in Ohio, actually, I at know. Monster Fest. Uh, that was that was a fun time. We got a kind of a long chat there for a while. Yeah, that was good. Yeah. That was a good event too. That was a nice event. Oh, it was. Yeah. And uh, just a little plug for Small Town Monsters. They just announced that the second one uh, will be happening end of June of next year. So if you didn't get to go to the first Monster Fest, you really don't want to miss out on the second one because it's going to be even more wild. So that's right. my plug for them. Um, John, let's let's talk a little bit about who you are, just so listeners that haven't gotten to listen to the first John episode, which I recommend you do, but they want to know that you are the head naturalist at Salt Fork State Park in Ohio, correct? Yeah. Yeah. So it's the, uh, it's the largest state park in Ohio and it has the distinction of being Ohio's, um, Ohio's capital of, you know, the Bigfoot capital of the Buckeye state. Um, it's kind of where a lot of historically, it's sort of where a lot of the, uh, the state's, um, earlier Bigfoot sightings and Bigfoot reports kind of came from the Salt Fork area. Um, so it's, uh, it's got that distinction and uh I grew up around there so I kind of grew up around all of the uh all of that folklore and um and everything so it's uh yeah it's a pretty cool place I think it's the largest bigfoot conference east of the Mississippi is hosted at Salt Fork yeah and it, it's a it's a good time too um if you've ever if you've never had the opportunity it's a pretty cool pretty cool event also it's on my my I guess you could say Bigfoot bucket list. Uh, oh, oh, that's one of the, the one. Were, were, the were you not there on this there. year? It, that was kind of a blur for me um, this year. We because I, I have a table there every year, um, and that that event this year was a bit of a blur. <laughs> um, everything was we we were positioned in a good spot. Our table was right in front of the uh, right in front of the um, entrance to the conference room where all the speakers were. Uh, so oh, it was wow. non, it was nonstop all day talking to people. And, uh, it was, it was kind of a blur. I thought you were, I guess cryptid gone would have been the, would have been the last one that we got to chat at. Then if you weren't at the Bigfoot conference this year, it would have been the thing about Con these Kentucky. conferences. Yeah. If, uh, yeah, if listeners don't, if they don't know these, these conferences go really quick and if they you see so someone, quick. You've got to talk to them right then because you probably won't see them again right. later on in the day. Yeah. So, and that's, and, and it's hard for yeah. me to keep track. Like generally, uh, a lot of times I'm not like part of the conference. I just go there to chat with people, um, and things and, uh, you know, meet up with people like you, uh, you know, folks that I've gotten to know in this community. Um, but I mean, a lot of times I'll go with my family, like I'll drive my, family comes along. These are, we sort of do these Bigfoot conference trips now. Uh, it's a whole thing. So a lot of times my That's awesome. wife and my wife and kids will go, um, you know, go get cryptid stuff from all the artists and vendors there. 
And then I go like talk to folks like you, <laughs> you know what I mean? For the the whole day. Um, and my, oh, my yeah. wife, my wife is kind and- of my, uh, she's kind of like my hype man. She's the, uh, she, she will go chat with, <laughs> go chat with a podcaster at a table somewhere and then say, Oh, you should talk to my husband. He's, uh, he's the naturalist at salt fork. So she's gotten me so many, like I've gotten so many interviews. Oh, that's um, awesome. Just cause, just cause my, my wife will go, you know, chat with people and then say, Oh yeah, you, you'd like to talk to my husband. So that's kind of, you know, it's kind of cool. She's the, uh, she's the pallbearer to my undertaker, you know, um, a good, a good, there, yeah, there you, yeah, go. you know, <laughs> <that's> the, <laughs> she's was, my hype man. It was really um, nice to meet your, your family as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I mean the kids and the good, the kids good stuff. I'll, I'll, I'll go to it. So it's, you know, it's kind of one of our family things now is going to these conferences. So, yeah, we are going to do that for the first time next year. Um, and it's still in the works, but it looks like, uh, we'll, we'll be trying to swing down to Tennessee for the, uh, is it Smoky Mountain Bigfoot the Smoky Conference Mountain in, in, in July. That's another, that's so. another great event. That's another good one. Yeah. Um, it's, is it's it big really? too. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's good. very nice. That's, uh, I, I think Perfect. we went to the first one. Um, we haven't gone for a couple of years. It was, the, it was that summer where things started to get normal again after COVID before it all tanked one. You know what I mean? It was like summer yep. 2021. We all went and then, uh, everything kind of got weird again. Um, <laughs> But yeah, it was, uh, it's a really good, Oh yeah, it's a really good event. <laughs> that's a, that's a nice event. Um, a lot of good, a lot of good speakers at that one. It's a great venue too. I mean, Gatlinburg's great. You know, it's the Vegas, of the Smokies. It's awesome. Uh, you know? Um, oh, I am looking so forward to yeah. it. You have yeah, no Gatlin- idea. I love that Gatlinburg's stuff. Gatlinburg's awesome. I mean, yeah. it makes sense. Right. But right. <clears throat> so John, we, I, I asked you to come back on. Because I was really curious. I wanted to talk to you specifically about there's got to be some great Bigfoot stories or encounters that you've heard over the years to do with Salt Fork. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, I, I usually get somebody will tell me some story. Now, some of the it's it's incredibly difficult to vet all of these. You know what I mean? Uh, because some of them are extremely like a friend of a friend. Some of them are, you know, well, actually one that I'd like to tell you about today uh, happened in like 1981. So the park was still relatively young. I mean, the park had, had only opened in 72, officially opened in 72, like 70, between 70 and 72, the park had kind of opened in phases. Um, so the park was still relatively young when this particular one happened. But, you know, it was so it's that long ago, like 1981, 1982. Um, when I had heard about this and actually the, uh, the gentleman that this happened to had written in to another show, another podcast, and they were doing like a listener email day. And, uh, when I heard him tell a story about salt fork, I was like, I, so I contacted them and I said, is there any way I explained who I was? And I said, is there any way that I can get, um, this guy's contact, like this guy's email so I can maybe ta- talk to him and get a location. You know what I mean? Um, uh, where his sighting happened. Um, so I got his email and eventually connected with him and got to talk and, uh, kind of narrowed down the location. I mean, the part the park's 20,000 acres. So narrowing, sometimes narrowing down our location in the woods is a little, little tricky. Uh, but I kind of narrowed it down because of a couple of key things, which kind of play into the Bigfoot sighting, uh, to begin with. Um, but I can just, do, do you mind if I just tell you that particular encounter? If we get, if we, uh, Get, I, would get right into it. I would love to. I would love to. Yeah, go right ahead. So, uh, you so got this, it. This gentleman, we have a, we're, the whole park is, uh, like I said, it's 20,000 acres and we have, um, a few thousand acres of public hunting land that you're allowed to hunt fish trap on. You know, it's, it's public, uh, hunting land. And then, of course, there's, there's park land where hunting's prohibited because of, uh, you know, traffic, visitor traffic and things like that. You're obviously not allowed to hunt off of hiking trails, um, things like that. So there are parts of the park that are really rugged that people just don't go, you know, uh, not for any reason other than it's very difficult to get there. Um, so, 
Uh, this gentleman was hunting in the 1980s or in the early 1980s, like 1981, 1982 with his dad. Uh, and the story that he told was it was very cold, uh, nice snow on the ground. So he's deer hunting and uh, they had shot a doe and the doe ran off um, and they were tracking it and they got within about a hundred yards of it. They found that they located the doe, you know, followed the, the blood trail, located the doe and standing over top of the doe was about an eight foot um, bipedal hair covered animal that proceeded to scoop up their deer, throw it over their shoulder and walk off, kind of looked at them for a second, turned around and walked off and they were just frozen. So obviously when I heard that story, I'm like, man, that is a great, you know, that is a great encounter. Uh, you know, it, uh, and I mean, on, on the other side of that, like what, a, what a great hunting story to begin with. You know what I mean? Like, Oh no. Like, and that's what makes me kind of, uh, think that this was maybe there there's, I don't think that he's lying to me, you know, because I mean, if you're going to lie, why not shoot a buck that's this big and the, the, you know, a Bigfoot takes it and carries it off. You know what I mean? He said he shot a doe. Um, so he wasn't, he wasn't stretching the truth as far as like, Oh, you know, I shot a 10 point buck. It was a, uh, you know, it was a doe that he shot, but I mean, man, what a great story. So I, he, he'd written into another show. They read this story on air and I, I had to contact him. So when I talked to him, um, he explained the whole thing, told me the story, uh, was, you know, and very few frills. That's another thing that didn't really turn my, you know, didn't really like, uh, trigger my like BS radar was that, you know, that there were very few frills. It was basically straightforward. Right. He said, no, you know, I shot this deer, we tracked it and there was this thing standing over it. It scooped it up, threw it over its shoulder and walked off. Um, and the, uh, I, I really wanted to know location because it's a huge park. So I really, and he told me he could, rem he remembered walking up a horse trail and there that they were hunting out of an old apple orchard. Uh, now the park is made up of 200 plus old farms that used to be functioning up until the fifties when the state started buying land. Um, so some of them were very small, you know, 20 acre farms. Some of them were over 200 acres. Um, and uh, when he said there was an apple orchard, um, I knew pretty much, he told me what, where at approximately in the park he was. And then when he said there was an old apple orchard, I was able to like, figure out because I knew, I knew where an old apple orchard was in that area. So, and it's a very rugged place, but here's, here's my thinking too. Like, uh, an old apple orchard still got, you know, it's a great place to deer hunt because those old apple trees still produce apples. Now they're going to be like tiny and bitter and, you know, hard apples, but it's a great place to deer hunt because the deer don't care in the middle of winter calories are calories. You know what I mean? So if they're old dried out apples still hanging out on the trees, those are still calories and it would stand to reason that something, you know, that had, that needs the caloric intake of like a four or 500 pound bipedal, you know, animal like a Bigfoot would also not pass up those calories regardless of their, you know, little bitter apples or not. So, uh, so that location, you know, I'm like, man, that is ideal. Cause it's off of any, there's no trails. It's, it's out of the, it's out of the way. Uh, the closest thing is a bridle trail, a horse trail. Um, that kind of cuts up through there and uh, interesting, like interesting uh, in its own. It's one of the locations like near the, the nearest road. There is one of the spots that we people claim to see black bears quite a bit, but this is in the 1980s when black bears in Ohio would have been like really scarce. Um, they've only just in the last like 20 years started to come back into the Eastern part of the state. Um, so it, talking to, you know, looking at the 19 in 1981 or 1982, there weren't a, you know, there, there wasn't an abundance of black bears coming across over from West Virginia and Pennsylvania at the time. Now, now it's less, it's, uh, it's not uncommon to have a black bear. I mean, we're nowhere near like Tennessee where we need bear proof dumpsters, at least, uh, like not yet, but, right. um, <laughs> you know, they're, they're around, uh, I've had one on, on my property, um, here, and I live about nine miles from the park, 10 miles from the park. So, uh, they're around, you know, but, um, I'm kind of, I, I don't think that it would have been a black bear, um, in that case, just because of the time period that night in the 1980s. But now, um, 
Mm. Now this is kind of one of the locations that people occasionally see black bears. Um, and my thinking is, you know, well, they, there's probably a significant overlap between a lar- two, two large omnivores. You know what I mean? Uh, as far as sharing habitat, like you've got two, two large omnivores. They probably share very, very similar habitats, you know, um, and this would be a good spot for either of them. Uh, so that's, that's a kind of an old, you know, kind of an old story again, 1980s. Um, and then, like I said, I'm telling, I'm retelling it because the gentleman, um, gave me permission to kind of retell that story. Um, but it's oh, absolutely. Cool it's, it's always um, important to get permission. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, so the, then, uh, I have, uh, one memorable story, uh, it happened in the earlier early two thousands. Um, two fishermen were night fishing there for catfish. We've got these, we've got these kind of big mutant flathead catfish, like these, you know, these kind of river monster catfish that live in the lake, you know? Um, oh, so, like so night fishing style stuff. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So night fishing is a kind of a big pastime in the park because of the, because of these big, these big flathead catfish, you know, they can get up to like 60 pounds, that sort of thing. It big, that's a big fish. Oh, man. Um, so we, uh, there were two night fishermen, um, kind of on the North end of the park, uh, near an area known as Hosack's cave, which ha- actually has its own encounter and has like, uh, which I'll kind of get to the closest thing that I have ever personally seen firsthand that could resemble a, a footprint. You know what I mean? Uh, that someone didn't say, Hey, we found a footprint. Wow. You want to come check it out? Uh, yeah, me and actually me and two of the guys from, uh, Sasquatch tracks were out hiking at Hosex cave and found, you know, found something that looks suspiciously like a, a big footprint. Um, it wasn't great. You know what I mean? Wow. Uh, but this is in the same area, but those gentlemen, uh, were night fishing in that area and started having, they described between softball and bowling ball sized rocks getting, and they said they weren't getting rolled down the hill or chucked straight at them. They were getting like catapulted. They said they lo- looked when we finally started, cause we kept hearing these big splashes. And he said, when we, when we looked up, we could see them like arc out of the woods, out of the trees. They actually would arc out of the trees and then into the lake, you know, um, at them. And they said, uh, y- you know, they were, they were, uh, it would be really hard in my opinion for a, you know, person to, you know, Hulk, um, softball size, you know, hunk of black hand sandstone up out of the trees, clear over the tree line, you know, and into the water from the hillside. So they were, Oh uh, yeah, that would be intense. Yeah. Yeah. So they, and they witnessed this for, uh, for a while. And the thing was the the rocks kept getting close, like kept getting, you know, they kept getting launched from a closer and closer location. Uh, so they kind of skedaddled out of there, you know, they, they, um, got out of there, but immediately told people like that. I believe they might've even done a beef BFRO report on it. I think it might be, I think it might be on the BFRO database for Ohio. Um, but it was, uh, you know, that, that's an interesting story, uh, there. I have not gotten the chance to speak to those two individuals. Um, this is one of those stories that is like one of salt fork stories, you know, that's a, it's kind of the park story now, you know what I mean? Uh, that, and then there's oh, one, it's like and the this campfire is, story. That's this is one of the, yeah. and there's also, there's also one that I have no, I've got no, um, I I'll tell this because it's, it's important in this, in this, uh, community and in this, this subject, it's important to keep some, uh, keep some skepticism. Like you should be, you should be open-minded. Um, hmm. but uh, as a good scientist, you need to, you need to have some skept- skepticism, you know? And, uh, I do have one story that, uh, I've got no evidence that it actually happened, but it gets retold and retold and retold. And, and <laughs> I can't, I can't find a single, uh, I can't find a single speck of evidence that it actually, actually happened, you know? Um, but there's the story, our primitive camp is in an area called Bigfoot Ridge. Now it's called that um, because of the Bigfoot activity that had happened there in the past and also kind of a marketing thing, you know, everybody knows that we, like we do kind of market, you know what I mean? Uh, salt, Bigfoot salt pork spread and butter. So we do, we do use it, you know, like you, whenever I get accused of like, oh, you're, uh, you know, you're, um, 
are uh, people will often say something like, well, have you ever caught any, like, have you ever caught any, you know, gruff from like talking about Bigfoot? I'm like, well, it'd be different if you couldn't go to the gift store and get a Bigfoot plushie. You know what I mean? Like it's kind of, it's kind okay. of, yeah. you know what I mean? Like it would be different if I were just some, if I were just yeah. like, Hey, you know, no one's talking about this, but these things are happening. That'd be totally different than I'd be like, but you know, you can go to the gift shop and buy a Bigfoot coffee mug. Uh, so talking about, it's not such a big, not, not quite the big deal that sometimes it gets made out to be. Um, but, uh, this particular story w- involves two people who were in a car, um, uh, a man and a woman in a car uh, parked on what, what back then was just a picnic area uh, in the middle of the night. And right. uh, something large, hairy and two legged picked up the rear end of their car and held it. You know, they were, they were gunning, gunning the gas and uh, couldn't go anywhere. And finally it dropped it and they took off and they, uh, they told, a, they allegedly had told a park ranger about it. Um, and, that's kind of where that the Bigfoot portion of the story ends. Um, but then there's this whole other portion that's kind of this conspiratorial cover up uh, that also probably never happened um, that uh, I've been told by so many people that, oh, yeah, after that happened, uh, we tried to go out there to see, you know, where it happened at. And there were two armed rangers, just, you know, blocking off the road and telling turning people away. Um, so here's the thing, the number of people that have told me that they, they went there and two Rangers said, there's a, there's an unknown animal, uh, and turn them away. Like there, there would have been a line of cars, uh, clear out of the park because of the number of people that said I was there that night oh, and I went okay. and two yeah. Rangers turned me away. You know what I mean? Also, I have spoke to a, uh, I had spoke to a retired Ranger, um, back when they called them Rangers still. Uh, who, who was not afraid to like talk about Bigfoot. He actually had one of his, he, he was on, um, he was on monster quest, uh, the salt pork episode of monster quest, oh, um, wow. telling a story about, a uh, an animal looking in the window, uh, at the old ranger station at one point. Um, so not afraid to talk about it. He has no recollection of this and he'd been, he would have been there. He was like one of the first officers that got hired, uh, at Salt Fork. So he would have been there. You know what I mean? So I have no evidence it, that when we talk about campfire stories, that one comes up over and over. So it has to have, it's got to have a nugget of truth somewhere. Like someone had to be freaked out while they were in the, in their car with their girlfriend, something happened. You know what I mean? But it has grown into this like, Oh yeah, I was there that night. There were, there were Rangers, you know, turning, turning people away because of something was going on. You know what I mean? Like I had an aunt and uncle tell me about, <laughs> tell me about that same story. And I'm like, I've got no, there's no evidence that this happened, you know? Um, but there's gotta be a nugget of truth. And in that area, uh, people have, there have been some really compelling like audio recordings that I've heard that people have, have collected. Uh, I know, I know really? one researcher. Yeah. So I know one researcher that, uh, would make it a habit of just carrying around like the little digital, you know, tape recorders you can get at like the college bookstore, you know? And, uh, he would just turn them on and put them like in the crotch of a tree as he's walking. You know what I mean? And then kind of collect them on his way back just to see if it picked up anything. Uh, so not the most, not the most uh, technologically advanced thing, but you know, it's something. Um, and it's not a terrible idea. I mean, I'm sure you can pick up all kinds of stuff. And uh, he has actually recorded some really interesting things. Um, one recording that was really uh, fascinating to me and fascinating to him. Like he was fascinated about it because he remembers when he recorded it, uh, you can hear, you can hear him like turning on the recorder and putting it in the tree. And then you hear him walk off with his two feet. You know what I mean? Um, you can hear him walk off and each, each recorder that he had, had the same recording, you know, kind of the shuffling around. You can hear him positioning it and then him, him walking off clearly bipedal, you know, and just, a just 10, 15 seconds after he walks off something very heavy and bipedal, walks right by, you know, and you can hear this crunch, 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 and it fades off. And every single recorder picked this up after he, you know, 10, 15 seconds after he had placed the recorder. So, so it was like something was just tracking him just far enough. You know what I mean? Um, so that, that, 
to me is kind of an interesting, um, interesting story. Uh, but that whole area, that Bigfoot Ridge area, it's called that, uh, partially because, you know, it's kind of a campy thing, but also because it historically had some sightings. I mean, there's the story about the two people in the car. Uh, but there's also when it was still a picnic area, there's also a story about a family, uh, picnicking and seeing two of them just kind of come out of the woods and nonchalantly walk back into the woods, you know, walk through. Yeah. And, uh, they, they witnessed it. They sort of all, you know, stopped eating their potato salad and watched and froze, you know, and then, then, you know, and had to find somebody to tell about it. Um, so that whole area has its own, uh, its own sort of legends and stuff. And it is pretty remote. Um, I actually, I'm pretty familiar with that area uh, because I, I have uh, done a lot of hikes back there and stuff. So, and it's, it's pretty remote and pretty rugged. I, I usually will take people. If I've got say like a reporter that wants to, wants to really go out and like, I'm not going to take them on a really heavily traffic trail. So I'll usually take them out, uh, out there just to kind of get them out in the woods. And it feels, you know what I mean? It feels m- more remote uh, than say one of our, Right. Or pretty common trails. Um, so, you know, it's a, that's a, uh, that's an interesting area. Uh, so here, here most recently, this is kind of an interesting story. And, and, you know, when you're involved in this community, uh, you get all kinds of, you get all, all, all manner of stories, you know, um, and sometimes it's Absolutely. really hard to vet. And like, I've noticed a lot of times people just need someone to listen to them. You know what I mean? And go, wow, interesting. You know, that's fascinating. Um, they don't need, they don't even need, necessarily need somebody to analyze. This is one thing that I kind of go back and forth with some of the, my research friends, like some of the, some of the people that are hardcore, you know, Bigfoot researchers, uh, rather than like <coughs> what I primarily do is education. Um, so rather than doing, you know, a lot of heavy, I, I do, I do a fair amount of research, but I, I always say I spend more time out looking for snakes and salamanders and stuff than I do Bigfoot, you know, um, because mm. I think it's important if you're, if you're in this, if you're studying this, you shouldn't just be studying, you should be, you should be kind of taking it all in, you know, you should take like a naturalist's approach to it, you know, you should be trying to take it all in. So I, I try to do, uh, as much research as I can, but I'm always, you know, kind of more interested in other stuff while I get, to, I get distracted while I'm out there. You know what I mean? I'm out, I, you know, it's, uh it's pretty rare for me to be able to go out and like just set in the woods and, and squatch, you know, um, I'll usually get distracted by like, Oh, cool. This is cool plants here or something, you know? Um, but I kind of go back and forth with a lot of the researchers at the park where it's like, sometimes, (laughs) sometimes people aren't necessarily telling you story, their story for you to like analyze it and figure out what they saw and tell them, you know, what you think about it. Sometimes they just need to tell their story. You know what I mean? Um, sometimes they just need to get it out there. Uh, oh, yeah. and, and you're a good outlet for that, you know, uh, because a lot of times, a lot of times the researchers will get real laser focused, you know, and they'll be like, oh, well, you know, I kind of doubt that that's what you saw. You probably saw a black bear because this situation or, or, oh, you know, what you were seeing was actually some sort of, and, you know, they would, they'll, they'll kind of uh, speculate as to what, was going on, you know, why, why they saw it in that context or something. And I'm like, well, sometimes people aren't really looking for that. They're just kind of looking to tell your story. And, uh, and here, there's um, a place for that. Right. But yeah. Yeah. Right. There is a place to like analyze stuff, but sometimes if somebody comes up after a program and they don't directly ask me, what do you think of this? A lot of times what they get is, wow, that's fascinating. Thank you so much for sharing because that's interesting because I, I, you know, I can't be rude to people. You know, and I also can't like, I don't Mm want to like, if they clearly saw a black bear, I don't want to say, well, that's just silly. You clearly saw a black bear. You know what I mean? But also like, I mean, I've had some people who get really into like the, uh, the sort of, um, ooky spooky paranormal Bigfoot stuff, you know, where Bigfoot's maybe not a critter. It's more of a paranormal being. And it's, you know, they talk about portals and things like that. And a lot of times all the best I can do is like, oh, orbs and stuff, yeah, orbs and you know, right. And uh, I will admit that there is weird stuff that kind of goes on once you get into the subject and the same, same goes for like ufology or, you know, uh, 
paranormal, any paranormal. So like once you get into the subject, you start seeing really weird stuff. You know what I mean? Like you start, you start experiencing like weird things, ha- not necessarily paranormal things. That's not what I mean, but like it kind of opens you up to like, it kind of, uh, you start, you start like observing things that you're like, huh. And I'm really comfortable now saying like, yeah, I don't know. Um, that's really strange. Um, for instance, the most recent story that I've got, uh, came at the end of April this year, uh, actually right before the Bigfoot conference, uh, end of April. Um, it was still kind of slow. The campground wasn't packed, you know? Um, and a lady and her husband, uh, about five in the morning got woke up. Uh, their dog started going crazy, just going nuts in their camper. And they got woken up, uh, by their camper was actually rocking back and forth. You know, um, they could feel it. And they said it wasn't violent. They said it was like someone was standing on top of it and just kind of like gently rocking it back and forth from on top of the camper, you know? And they said they could, they couldn't quite put their finger on it. Why there's no wind. And they said it was clearly like rhythmic, you know? And, uh, they said, finally, uh, it stopped and they heard some rustling around and the husband went out with the dog and looked around, no footprints, no anything. And she goes up to the camp store to tell somebody about it. And she opens up the door and all of a sudden there's all this Bigfoot stuff in the camp store. And she's like, Oh, is, is Bigfoot like a, is Bigfoot a thing? You know what I mean? Here. And you know, they told her, yeah. And she's like, Oh man. So last night we got woken up first thing that, you know, well this morning we got woken up by something on the roof of our camper, rocking the camper back and forth, you know? And she said it wasn't violent, but it was enough to like notice it was like a noticeable rocking back and forth. And, uh, uh, you know, she told me this story and she's like, I, and it's just like, we couldn't find any tracks, but honestly, I don't, we were expecting to go out and see like, you know, a, a, a person, you know what I mean? Or a, a really big raccoon or something, a bear, you know what I mean? Something. And there's just nothing there. And, uh, you know, that particular story, I'm like, I, I don't know what to make of that because it could have been, it, it could have been a bear. <laughs> I mean, it could have been a bear. Uh, probably wasn't a person. I feel like what? I don't know. We don't have, we don't have like a ton of really like, we don't have that. We don't have like a problem with like men- mentally ill people just sort of like, r- you know, running through the campgrounds causing, you know, issues. I feel like some, someone else would have noticed randomly something. pushing trailers. Yeah. yeah but the, yeah. You know, that was kind of an, and she was in a loop, uh, which it has, its own like kind of history of Bigfoot. Actually, one of our really well-known Bigfoot prints came from just down over the hill from where her campsite was. Um, and it's kind of, it's like, I believe this particular print is actually the original is in Cliff's museum, uh, like Cliff Barrickman's museum. Um, he's got, he's got one of the originals or the original of this footprint uh, from oh, 2012. Cool. Yeah. So, that whole area has its own, uh, it, its own history of Bigfoot sightings, a very well known sighting, uh, um, that happened just, it happened on a trail just adjacent to a loop in the campground. Um, a gentleman named Walter Tippy back in 2011. Uh, he was actually a vendor at the, at a, uh, at, it might not have been the Bigfoot conference, it might have been like Creature Weekend or one of the, one of the little like proto Bigfoot conferences that used to happen at the lodge. Um, mm-hmm. but he was a vendor there and he was, he had talked to these two fishermen, uh, who had said they'd seen something out in the woods. So he was going to go meet a friend and they were going to go investigate, you know, uh, and he went out and he looked up on the hillside heading toward a loop and he thought it was his friend. He thought, he, like, why is he wearing this jacket? That's what he, that was his first thought. Why is he wearing, you know, a raincoat? And uh, then he noticed there were two of them. Oh. And he said, as he was watching, they sort of glided up the hill. And he said they were going so fast that it was no way that it was his friend. You know, his friend had two fake knees, something like that. You know what I mean? Like his friend wasn't going to glide up a hill. And he witnessed it right in that area. So that area does have its own, its own sort of, uh, its own sort of um, history with Bigfoot stuff. And like I said, um, the cave area, uh, a former employee at the lodge 
um, was heading to work one day, uh, one night, actually heading to work one night and uh, witnessed something, witnessed this black shape sort of stand up from the side of the road. Like it was setting on the side of the road, stand up, walk sort of parallel to the road for a bit and then cross. And uh, when they got to work, um, they said, I saw something that I can't explain. You know, they, they told their, their boss that they're like, well, I was on the way to work and I th- think I saw a Bigfoot, you know? So they actually put them in contact with some uh, Bigfoot researchers who came out and investigated and collected a print from the, from the soft shoulder on the side of the road uh, right there at the cave. And uh, right in that area, that whole, that cave area, that's where the uh, rock throwing happened. And like I said, that's where the closest thing to a footprint that I've seen uh, that's where, that's where I saw the closest thing to a footprint that I have personally witnessed, um, was right there. Um, and that whole area. So there's, there's lots, there's sort of these little hot spots and salt fork, you know, um, and the cave and a loop, uh, are two of them. And then we have group camp and group camp, uh, is kind of out in the willy wags compared to the rest of the park. It's like a, uh, it's an area where say a scout group or a church group could, uh, could, could rent and it's a primitive site, but you know, it's for a large, like for a large group. Uh, and it's real primitive. Like, uh, there's no water, uh, out no potable. The yeah. And there's no potable water. It's pit latrines. You know what I mean? Um, and it's where I think probably the last time we talked, I had, I had talked about the tree knock that I had heard the one time, um, probably. Yes. Um, but yeah. So, uh, which is a whole nother thing like tree knocks. I don't get me started. Cause I kind of don't think that they're probably not knocking a piece of wood on a tree. You know, it's probably mechanical, but, um, the, uh, that area has, there's an area within group camp that, Bigfoot researchers like affectionately call the bleachers because multiple times people have witnessed, you know, uh, like a small group of sort of large shadowy shapes, just sort of watching whoever is camping in the group camp, you know? So they kind of call, they call that area the bleachers because they just sort of, you know, there's an area where like people will witness stuff, just sort of watching whoever's camping there, you know? Uh, which is pretty creepy, right? I mean, that's a, you know, um, yeah, that's really creepy. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. And like I said, the, the researchers that stay there frequently refer to that area as the bleachers. Um, and it's interesting. I talked to, uh, so where I had that tree knock and kind of some stuff happen in that area, uh, I had gone back to a re there was a research group, uh, stand back there and I went back just to chat with them. And this one old fellow walks up and I, he, I said, uh, I said, yeah, right over whoever's staying over in that campsite. I'm like, that's where, uh, that's where I had like the closest thing to an experience that I've ever had. And again, it's no smoking gun. Like I, uh, I, I can't say with any certainty that there's something out there. I know that there's something out there because people are seeing something, you know what I mean? But like, I haven't experienced something that tells me like a hundred percent there's this undiscovered primate, you know? Um, but there's gotta be Mm. something to it. And that, that was the closest experience I've ever had to like an encounter was right in that, that area. And he's like, Oh, that is exactly, that's exactly why I picked that spot. Every time we camp here, he's like, I picked that spot because something happens there every time. He said, it might be simple. He said, it might be acorns getting chucked out of the woods and hitting my tent. He said, but something happens when I stay in that spot every time. And I'm like, well, I mean, something happened there when I stayed there and it was enough to like creep me out, you know? So, uh, so yeah, I mean, we, uh, and like I said, man, I get, I get stories like once a week through at at the park, but some of them are so, so incredibly hard to vet, you know? Uh, And some of them are as simple as like, oh, I was, you know, I was driving one night, man, something ran across the road in front of me and for the life of me, I don't know what it was you know, and, uh, right. And un- unfortunately on, on the other side of this, because salt fork has such a history and has such a, uh, it's so popular at the park. Um, we also have a lot of hoaxes that have happened. There are a lot of, there's really good videos that get every once in a while, they'll show up on social media. You know, somebody will dig them back up. And they're, they're not real. Like we know that they're not real. Like we know who did them, those sorts of things. 
And it's kind of unfortunate, you know, same goes any, anywhere where there's like a prevalence of this sort of stuff, you get those hoaxes. And that's kind of unfortunate because I, that makes our job to, more difficult because I got to suss out, well, was it somebody in a suit? You know what I mean? Like that's, I got to suss out whether it's a hoax or not. You know what I mean? Um, and that makes it, but, um, I do, I do, uh, I do believe a fair number of people that I talk to because many of them, uh, don't have any skin in the Bigfoot game, so to speak. You know what I mean? Like they're not hardcore researchers. Oh, interesting. They're, okay. You know yeah. I mean? So there, yeah. there is a good portion of people who like don't seem to have any reason to kind of, you know what I mean? Like they, they seem like normal people. Like they're not having a psychotic episode. They seem like normal people, you know? And, uh, it's, it's hard for me to completely disregard them. You know, um, it's hard for me to disregard, mm. uh, some of those stories in particular. I mean, even not from like, I mean, from salt work, but I mean, a few years ago, a few years ago, uh, a, uh, nice, you know, little old lady with her family at the park, uh, came, came over and she was looking, I've got a map where people can put pens in if they've had an experience, you know, it's a map of Ohio and if they've had an experience and some of them like clearly, you know, they pr probably didn't see Bigfoot in downtown Columbus. You know what I mean? Like in a Metro park in downtown Columbus, like which Ho hopefully you know, not. <laughs> yeah. Like, pro you know, you pr probably didn't like, uh, but you know, I, so uh, but the, the map's kind of interesting because you start seeing like trends, you start seeing where, where like pins will start to cluster together. You know what I mean? And, uh, most of them are in areas oh, yeah. where like it's heavily wooded, lots of vegetation or it's heavily agricultural, which is another interesting thing, you know? Um, and I had this lady and she's like, well, you know, uh, this is only Ohio. And what happened to me happened in West Virginia. And I was just a kid. She's and it, she said, but it was right, right over the border. Can I put a pin? Can I put a pin in the white spot on the map where about where it would be in West Virginia? I said, yeah, sure. You know, do it. Like, uh, so she put a pin like in the blank spot. And I, I said, do you want to tell me your story? And she said, yeah. So she's like, I'm old enough that I actually went to a one room schoolhouse. You know, she's like, I went to school up to like fourth oh, wow. grade in a one room schoolhouse. And, uh, she said that, you know, she remembers very clearly when she was and there was one uh, one spring where there was a monkey who kept bothering the school. There was a monkey that would come in and look oh, in the geez. window at the school. And uh, and she's like, you know, it wasn't until I was older that I realized that West Virginia didn't have monkeys, you know, <laughs> like and uh, and, you know, that it probably was. And I'm like, see, I but I have uh, she was like a little old grandma. You know what I mean? Like she could have been my grandma. And it was, it's really hard for me to just to be like, yeah. and that might be a bias that, you know, it's a, you know, uh, observational bias thing. You know what I mean? Where I'm like, oh, you're a sweet little old lady. You wouldn't lie to me. But uh, it's really hard for me to dismiss You'd her never story. Lie you to know? me. <laughs> yeah, right. You know, um, right. really hard for me to. And it's also kind of a fascinating story. She's like, oh, yeah. It wasn't until I was older that I realized, like, we probably weren't seeing a monkey, you know. Um, so uh, So I get stories like that quite a bit. I have a question for you regarding uh, stories that come into you. Would you say most of them are like, I kind of caught a glimpse of something. I couldn't really see it. Or there are, do you get any where it's like, I literally was looking at the face of the creature. It's a, it's a primate. I saw it yeah. dead on. Or is it so, kind of like glimpses in the shadows? Uh, I guess a, a majority of them, as you kind of would expect, are like I was out and we saw something, you know, something went running through the woods. There are, I have had people come in and tell me like, I saw this, you know, I clearly saw it. Um, a gentleman fishing, fishing just outside the park, uh, saw something across the creek. He was fishing like in the spillway area where our dam is. So it's kind of a Creek, you know, uh, he was fishing in the Creek and across the Creek, he saw something that he described, you know, and he said that it, it basically, uh, it scared him because it kind of went crazy. He said it went crazy like a monkey goes crazy, tossing leaves and sticks and things. And he said, uh, he said he took he took off. He said, but he saw it. He said it was a it was a long, tall, uh, definitely a long, tall primate. And he said it was behaving like a primate. You know, he said it was throwing sticks up in the air and leaves and making noise. And he s saw it dead on. Um, 
And, you know, it's, it scared him. He actually, wow. he actually had reported that one to a researcher. Um, and it scared him. Uh, he said, you know, he's like, I'm a vet, you know, and it like a, a veteran. And he's like, I, I'm, I'm not scared of much, but it, it scared me. You know, he said, it's, cause it was just so, un- it was something that you don't expect to see, you know, in Southeast Ohio, you know? Um, so yeah, I mean, mm-hmm. uh, we do, we do get instances where people have, uh, we've, you know, we've got the, the sort of tent pokers, you know what I mean? People have reported something like pressing down the top of their tent, you know, uh, that's, um, so, hold on, ho- hold on. <laughs> so I find that very interesting. Cause I just talked to a gentleman from New Hampshire, had the same thing happen. Oh, okay. So is this like a normal occurrence that's happening in Salt Fork? Uh, it's not, it's not normal. I mean, I don't have people come in all the time and tell me like, Oh, you know, right. something pushed down on the top, but it, it's one of the things that has been reported. It's not just been reported here. I mean, um, I don't know if you know, you, J- John Mianzinski has a, he has a story about oh, yeah, something definitely. kind of pushing, pushing down on his tent, you know, and him thumping at the knee, you know what I mean? Um, and, uh, so yeah, I mean, it's something, and, and it would, again, I try to look at all this from like a naturalist standpoint where it's like, well, is there, is there like a precedence out in nature for this sort of thing? But it's like, yeah, I mean, it look like a raccoon mm. is curious, you know, or a black bear. Like if there's something, if there's this little pod and maybe, you know, you, you might have like granola bars or something in your, you know what I mean? If it smells like food, if it smells like an easy meal, True. you know what I mean? Uh, something's going, you know, it would, it would stand to reason that something would be like, Hey, if I, maybe I'll just, I mean, we do that kind of stuff. Like, Oh, maybe I'll just poke it. You know what I mean? Uh, maybe I'll just poke it and see, you know what I mean? We what's, do that. what's in there? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Oh, Oh, don't want to mess with that. It's screaming, whatever it is. I got to get, you know what I mean? Uh, like, <laughs> so that's, here. yeah. Are, are most of the reports you get pretty tame or are there any, uh, aggressive occurrences that happen inside um, the park? Most of them are pretty tame. Again, most of them are like, uh, I saw something okay, across good. the road. Um, I, I, I had a gentleman, um, I don't know, a couple of years ago, come to a hike, come to a Bigfoot hike and tell a story about being bluff charged. Uh, I, I was kind of skeptical mm-hmm. about his story. Um, mostly because of the word bluff charge. Like it seemed like he'd sort of had that. He'd sort of built up this scenario in his head. You know what I mean? Um, but I mean this, there was a story about a gentleman being like bluff charged, like, you know, something ran kind of toward him and stopped just short and until he ran off, you know? Uh, but yeah, I don't get other than like the rocks getting chucked out of the woods, you know, I mean, I guess that could be, I guess that could be kind of viewed in an aggressive, you know, light, you know what I mean? Uh, rocks getting chucked at some fishermen, but, could be. um, yeah, it could be, I don't know. You know, again, this is this is where I start to like. This is one of my shortcomings. Is I have such a hard time like wildly wildly speculating about what things mean when it comes to experiences and things like that. You know what I mean? And it's one of the things that frustrates me mm. uh, for, from like a naturalist and a biologist standpoint. Is like animals behave. Um, they, they will behave in odd ways for no reason sometimes. You know what I mean? Like sometimes animals are just behaving weird, you know? Um, but for the most part, you can kind of, animals are kind of predictable. You know what I mean? Like you kind of know, um, what's going to happen with animals. Like for the most part, you can kind of guess what's going to happen. Like you can read an animal's body language and things like that. You know what I mean? They're, they're kind of predictable, but this is something that we don't have oh, sure. much real information about, you know what I mean? Like, so wildly speculating that a, a tree that you found twisted up is because of, uh, you know, frustration, like, Oh, it was sitting here and people were walking through its territory. So it was just twisting this in a frustrated manner. Well, it's like, that's, that's speculative. It's pure speculation. And I get so frustrated because I'm like, we don't know enough. We do not know enough to start speculating about what things mean. How about we, spe- how about we start focusing on like, what is out there, you know what I mean? What could potentially be out there and not, not get so lost in the weeds with some of the, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, Oh, what's this mean? You know what I mean? Uh, the tree knock thing. Like I said, oh, I yeah, usually, no, when, pe- totally. when people bring that up, I'm like, don't get me started on tree knocks. Like, okay. So you're saying you hear three tree knocks. Uh, it means, Oh, there's three, you know, like 
you happen to be with a group of three people. So if you heard three tree knocks, that means that they are letting the other ones know that there are three people out there. You know what I mean? Like that, that is pure that speculation. That's very speculative. Yeah. Yeah. yeah right. Yeah. Like, but, oh, yeah. but if you're, t- if you're talking to the public, if you're doing a public program and you're the Bigfoot person, like you're the researcher that's doing a public program, uh, which is awesome, by the way, that you're doing library mm-hmm. stuff. I saw that on Instagram. That's awesome that you're doing like public education stuff. Oh, yeah. Let's, uh, that's awesome. Let's put a plug in for that real yeah. quick, John. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, go if you want to hear a Bigfoot presentation I'm doing uh, July 28th at Earlham Public Library because they found out that there's a person in their town that does a Bigfoot podcast. Awesome. So um, I may that's have told awesome. them to, I don't know, but you yeah. know, yeah. <laughs> but I mean, public education is the best. Like that's, you know what I mean? Like it's awesome that you're oh, doing yeah. that. So, but you know, like in a position where you're educating the public, like the, the lay public, you know, who is not, who aren't Bigfoot researchers who are just showing up because they have an interest in it, you know, and you say that, like, oh, well, there are three tree knocks means there's three people. You know what I mean? They see three people. There's three, three tree knocks. Then they take that to mean like, oh, well, they know mm. this. You know what I mean? And it's and it's like it's yeah, kind of counterproductive. Gotcha. You know what I mean? Um, oh, well, the Bigfoot researcher said that. So it's true. Well, we don't know anything. You know what I mean? And that's given them like an awful lot of credit. Like that's you know what I mean? That's giving them an awful lot of like this animal. We don't know anything about that, you know. May or may not exist, depending on where you fall. You know what I mean? Um, you're kind of saying like yeah. it, it can communicate in like a pretty advanced way. Like you know, oh, I'll do these three tree, and then you know the idea that it's a I, I I use tree knock because everybody knows what I'm talking about. You know, a wood knock. Everybody knows what I'm talking about. But uh, I always right, challenge right. people. I'm like, I always kind of challenge people. I'm like, all right, you know, we're in a mixed Appalachian hardwood forest here in Salt Fork. You know what I mean? Go out right now and find me a log on the ground that's suitably dense that you can pick up and make like a Louisville slugger home run noise by banging it against another tree. You know, (laughs) it's surprisingly hard because most of them are like punky. And if you do that, they're going to like blow apart into a million pieces. You know what I mean? Like most of the, you pick up a log off the ground in the woods, it's going to be punky and rotten. You know what I mean? And if you do find one that's like dense, it's covered in bark. Like you, you're, you're not going to be able to replicate it kind of, it seems improbable that these noises that people hear, these knocks uh, are coming. Like, it seems improbable that Bigfoot has like its own walking stick all the time that it's walking around, you know, banging on trees with. Um, so I've always assumed that if this thing is, if this thing is real and if it's out there, it's probably some sort of mechanism. Like it's probably popping its jaw or, you know, popping its lips or uh, even like, you know what I mean? Um, gnashing its teeth, something like that. Something that is rep, then they can replicate it. You know what I mean? Like they can, they can do it over and over with the same results, you know? Um, so I've, my, I've my heard from a, a few people that have been able to replicate the sound. I want to say Jonathan Easley is one of them. If not, sorry, buddy, you just got a shout out in my bad, but um, (laughs) they're able to make the sound by uh, kind of clapping their hands in front of their open mouth. I've heard that. I've heard that Um, that theory too. Yeah. And it makes a similar sound, a similar sound. Yeah. And that would make, yeah, that would make a lot more sense. And it would make a lot, it would make so much more sense to me than like, Oh, they're finding a suitable piece of wood finding a suitably large tree and doing that every time, you know what I mean? Uh, it would make right. a lot more sense to me. And I know, I know in some areas, like in the uh, Olympic peninsula, they have found rocks that seem to have like wear patterns on them. Like they were getting, you know, maybe smacked oh, yeah. together, you know? Um, I mean, that seems more like, again, it seems more likely than like, you know, a wood knock per se, but it's just kind of the generic term. That's at least that's my, opinion. And again, like I'm wildly speculating too. I'm just as guilty of it, you know, (laughs) like, um, but that's kind of when I approach this sort of thing. And when I hear stories, you know, I try to approach it from like a naturalist standpoint. That's kind of the, like, you know, I kind of joke, like I'm the Bigfoot naturalist. That's kind of like one of my Insta, you know, like my Instagram bio has the Bigfoot naturalist in it because it's like, well, I'm doing this, but I'm, 
I'm, I'm doing education and I'm not so much like, and I'm trying to approach this from like a naturalist standpoint, you know? Uh, so when I hear these stories, I'm like, man, why would it be behaving like this? You know what I mean? Uh, is there a precedence out in nature for something like this? Um, you know, I shine is kind of one of those weird things. People, I just, I just got a, uh, an alleged picture. Uh, and it's kind of like, I'm sure you see a fair number of shadowy blobs outlined in red on somebody's phone, right? I'm sure, I'm sure you Absolutely. see a fair number of them. Yep. Yeah. Um, this is kind of a shadowy blob with two. And I love them. Keep saying I, I, I love them too. I, I love, I love them. them too. No, yeah. I'm not bashing them. I'm just yeah, saying yeah, yeah. like, you know, I'm sure you see, yeah. you know, right. Right. Um, and yeah, I love them too. Like it's, it's, yeah, it's great. It's, you know, and it kind of, kind of moves the narrative forward too. You know what I mean? Like the whole, the, it, it, it's what drives this whole subject matter, you know? Um, so yeah, keep, keep at Absolutely. shadowy blobs. Uh, but you know, it's a shadowy blob with two pinpricks of light. You know what I mean? And it's, uh, I, I've always struggled with the eye shine thing because there aren't, there aren't, uh, gr- like there aren't great apes with a tapetum, you know, a tapetum lucidum at the back of their eye, the tissue at the back of their eye. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? And it's like, well, it, it doesn't mean there can, it couldn't be an example of like evolutionary convergence where two things evolve separately. I mean, wings are good uh, eyes, mm. for example, have evolved like the eye, the structure of the eye has evolved separately multiple times throughout the history of life, you know? Um, so, you know, it's not to say that there couldn't be, there couldn't be an evolutionary precedence for it, where it's like evolutionary convergence, where they, they evolved a tapetum separately from everything else. You know what I mean? Uh, it's not to say that that that's not the case, but I've always struggled with the eye shine also, you know, because animals climb trees. So a raccoon can be eight feet off the ground and has eye shine. You know what I mean? Um, so I, I like, or a barred owl landing in a tree, you know, landing in a uh, mm. branch that's seven or eight feet off the ground. And you shine your light on it and you get these two pen pricks that are eight feet off the ground. You know what I mean? Like you get the, the two glowing eyes mm-hmm. that are eight feet off the gr- ground, you know? Um, so, you don't. I, I don't know. I've always struggled with the, the eye shine thing. Uh, but I'm not going to like dismiss it because we don't know, you know what I mean? Like we don't know for sure. So I'm not going to dis- dismiss it completely. John. Uh, yeah. So thank you. Thank you so much for sharing some stories from Salt Fork. Very, very cool stuff. At Monster Fest, you, you were sharing with me that story about the weird like horse. Yeah. Type, or the horse yeah. got um, yeah, yeah. attacked. And we might yeah. talk about that uh, after the that show sounds, that sounds uh, good. for the, for the Patreon side of things. Yeah. But, um, but thank you so much for coming on. How, how can people keep up to date with, you know, what, what's going on in the world, the salt fork and, uh, yeah, John and so, all that good stuff. Um, as far as salt fork goes, if you just, if you like the salt fork Facebook page, that's usually the most up to date thing. Um, that that's probably the easiest is just look for salt fork state park on Facebook um, as far as I go, uh, if you, you can follow my Instagram, it's a uh, Hickenbottom John, um, on Instagram. Uh, if you follow it, I mean, I post, I occasionally post things about Bigfoot, but mostly I post some critters and stuff that I find. Um, <laughs> but it's a good way. It's a nice way to keep in contact with people. I do. I, I like Instagram a lot for keeping in contact with people. So it's Hickenbottom John. At Instagram, it's the the Bigfoot Naturalist, and you can see all of our all of our adventures here, and some of the stuff that I'm working on. I'm hoping I'm hoping uh, things are kind of like it's summer, so things are kind of crazy. Um, but things kind of in, our, in my personal life right now are slowing down. Like I was, I was actually working a second job for a little while, and things were kind of hectic, and I didn't get quite as much oh, wow. as much done as I uh, as I wanted to, you know. Um, but now things are kind of slowing down. Like I'm it's summer and the kids are home and I'm like, things are, you know, things are hectic at the park, but things are kind of slowing down here. And I'm hoping, uh, I'm hoping to actually eventually do some writing. Uh, I'd kind of like to put together like, you know, uh, something like the Bigfoot naturalists field manual, something like that. You know what I mean? Uh, not just to do Bigfoot research, oh, stuff, yeah. but something to like yeah. how to be a naturalist and how to do this sort of thing out in the field. You know what I mean? Um, and how to approach this from a naturalist point of view. Um, so I'm trying to like, I'm hoping to do a little bit of writing eventually, and that'll all be Instagram stuff. 
uh, you know, good, good Instagram fodder there once I get the, <laughs> the ball rolling on anything like that. Um, so yeah, I mean, lots there of exciting things. Oh, that's we're, awesome. uh, we're building a new nature center at Salt Fork. It should be completed in 2024. And, uh, Bigfoot's going to be a central theme in it. We're actually having, having a, uh, we're having a really uh, life, life size Bigfoot, the same, the same special effects artist, uh, Bo, Bo Bruins that did the uh, life size Bigfoot on, in Cliff's Museum is, uh, like in Cliff really? Music. He's doing, he's doing one for us. Yeah. Um, so that's going to be pretty cool. Yeah. Oh, that'll wow. Be, that'll be really cool. Yeah. So that is it really should, cool, yeah, man. Should be cool. Yeah. So lots of stuff happening. It's all exciting. Mm. Awesome. Well, awesome. John, thank you so much for coming on again. And if you go to a Bigfoot conference, you may just be lucky enough to see John in person. Yeah, just look just for the amazing mustache. The, but this, so good chatting with you, dude. <laughs> yeah, it's good chatting with you, too. Thanks for having me on. <laughs> Before we go, just want to say thank you to all the new listeners that have joined Bigfoot Society over the last few weeks on our podcast platforms and on YouTube. You guys are incredible. Things are exploding uh, just over the last month, I've gone from 15% to 39% on the way to becoming a full-time Bigfoot podcast. I appreciate you guys so much. It really makes a difference when you listen to the podcast weekly. Make sure you're subscribed and share this episode with a friend and also an online Bigfoot Facebook group or any other groups that you're in. Thank you so much. Here at Bigfoot Society, our goal is to provide a platform for those that have encountered Bigfoot to share their encounter in a safe and respected environment. But we need to hear your story. If you've experienced something that you just can't explain, please send me an email at bigfootsociety at gmail.com. Then we can start the conversation. I know a lot of you have not shared your encounter at all it's been 20 years and it's time that you get this off your chest and then you can get some well-deserved rest because i know you haven't been sleeping i understand what you're going through and i appreciate every one of you listening we hope to see you back next week for another episode of the bigfoot society podcast